This is a very brief history of preprints in brackets in the life sciences. I will touch upon uh, physics and some of the other places, but I'm not really, that's not the focus. I want to focus very much on the life sciences. And this is not a complete history. There's a huge amount to talk about when you talk about the history of preprinting, and I don't have time to cover it all in half an hour. Hopefully, this will stimulate many of you to go away and read up on more of the history because it is very, very interesting. If you do have any questions, feel free to email me or find me on social media or ASAP Bio on social media. You can also, this will be on YouTube by tomorrow. So feel free to add comments on YouTube and we can have a bit of discussion there too. So I want to start with a little bit of an overview of some of the big revolutions in academic publishing in general. And I think it would be a sensible starting point to begin with the printing press. This is a fairly obvious revolution. Um, it allowed the wide, easy dissemination of printed materials instead of having to copy everything out by hand. We then skip forward to the 17th century, where I would say the next big revolution happened. And this is the what I term historical peer review beginnings. If you want to learn more, we have a whole half hour session about history of peer review. And this is also where we start to really see the first printed journals appearing. These are just two images of men who were particularly involved in the peer review aspect of this. And then there was this really big gulf from the 17th century until the 1950s, where lots of things were happening. But when it comes to revolutions, it doesn't feel like much was really going on for academia until we hit the 1950s, where we have this expansion of journals that is really very much still continuing today. And we get the development of the current business approach to academic publishing. This was spearheaded by this man here, Robert Maxwell. Again, we have a whole half hour session on that if you want to learn more. And I think this, these two things are quite nicely tied together because in many ways, the current business approach is a reaction to the difficulties journals that were being run by societies had faced right up until this point. And then we kind of start picking up pace a little bit. So in the 1970s, we have the establishment of things we would actually recognize as peer review and certainly the widespread adoption of peer review. Then the 1990s, I was born. That's probably not a revolution. But we did also get the Internet and we got Archive, which is the physics preprint server. And then in 2013, we had BioArchive. I could have continued on to do to include some of the more recent things that have started to happen around the preprint space. But I want to stop here at BioArchive because I've got a section later on where we're going to talk about what the future or what the current system is, is kind of looking like. So if I asked you when preprinting first started, I imagine a lot of you will probably say the 1990s. And I appreciate if you were born after the 1990s, you might not actually recognize what this is a photo of, which I'm sure makes everyone else on the call very sad. Um, and this is a common thing people say, because this, as I said on the last slide, is when we saw archive emerge. And archive is a very synonymous almost with pre-printing and pre-print servers. But this isn't actually true. There's two places you could go to for when preprinting first started. Technically, uh, preprinting was just the standard method of sharing science right up until the 20th century. And this is because we didn't have the system of peer review that we currently have. And preprint in the form of being a manuscript that is shared when the authors are ready, that's how science was shared for a very, very long time. It was when the authors felt it was ready to release to the world. I appreciate not everyone will necessarily agree with that technical approach. So another potential starting point for preprinting is actually around sort of the 1930s, 1940s. And during this period, we saw, particularly in the field of physics, a lot of preprint related roles beginning to appear. We saw various initiatives that I'm not going to talk about um, that sprung up here in terms of sharing work prior to peer review and a lot of things you would recognize are preprints. For the most part, this was all going on unofficially. And so this is why when I talk about preprinting and the beginnings of preprints, I like to talk about this early preprint attempt in the 1960s. This is 
especially true for biology. So biology's initial attempts at preprinting very much occurred in the 1960s. We did have some of these unofficial forms of sharing work happening before this, but this was an official program. And you probably already heard about these, but these were called the information exchange groups. They ran from the 1961 right up to 1967. So not a huge period where they were actually active, but they were really well received. In that six year period, we have two and a half thousand memos as they call them, uh, this is preprint as we would call them, being shared across three and a half thousand participants around 46 different countries. I think for the 1960s, this is an amazing buy-in. And the way this worked was you had your manuscript, you sent that to the NIH, told you I would come back and talk about the NIH. And then the NIH would make physical copies and they would mail those out physically, because it's before the internet, to those 3,600 participants. Now, these information exchange groups were not just one big group. It was split into multiple groups. It started with one group. And then by the 1967 sort of end, there were, I think, seven groups, seven different information exchange groups. And they were focused on various different topics. You could imagine, given the sort of biology-based research that was going on in the 1960s, that a lot of these had uh, basics, uh, basis in genetics or those kind of fields. So there were quite a lot of IEGs were at least somewhat geared towards genetics and molecular biology, which makes sense. Um, but they, they were also a bit more uh, further afield from that. And I said this, you know, based on these numbers, it was quite successful. So there was some early opposition to the IEGs, and a lot of that actually eroded away, and people became very supportive as this initiative ran. Unfortunately, it came to an end, I think, a little bit too early. And it's really worth talking about why it ended, because this places into the context our current uh, situation with preprinting and sort of why preprints now are continuing to flourish, whereas they did in the 1960s. When the IEGs ended, um, there wasn't a lot of research done about how effective they were. And I've gotten this data from, uh, I think it was a US military um, survey, actually. It's the only study I could find investigating the IEGs. And those involved said, so 94% of those involved had said that reading a memo had positively influenced a research decision that they had made. 68% considered that the memos had saved them time and money. And I think this tallies very well with kind of the, the survey data we get when we look at preprints now. People very broadly find them as a positive influence on their own work. And I don't think anyone would argue that they don't save people time and money. So why, if they were successful, why would they end? Unfortunately, we have to look at scientific societies as to why these ended. There was a meeting in the 1960s whereby effectively the outcome was that a number of journals would refuse to accept preprints. And this is, you can trace the Inglefinger rule uh, back to this period. And they give a number of reasons why they didn't like these IEGs. One was that it would lead to duplication. So you would have the, the memo or the preprint, and you'd also have the published version. And the publishers were concerned that this would cause issues in terms of things like what you cite, which is the, the final version, all those kind of things we hear very much still today. There were concerns around copyright infringement. And this is one of those arguments that today I think is not so much true, although we might come back and talk about that a little bit. And then there was the third issue that the traditional publishers had, which is that they were concerned there would be misunderstandings from a lack of peer review. This is a, a big thing we hear all the time still uh, when it comes to preprints. And effectively, these, these actions ended the information exchange groups. And so for a long time, that was it in terms of preprinting. There was still unofficial sharing, which has always kind of happened until you get to the next revolution, which is, I would say, the internet. And this brings us back to the 1990s. So Paul Ginsparg uh, created Archive initially without it being on the internet. 
And it was very much modeled on those, those IEGs. It worked in a very kind of similar way. But archive came about largely due to uh, mailbox limitations amongst physics researchers in the early 1990s. Anyone who was around then and using that like really early internet will understand just how small uh, your mailbox sizes were. You, this is a time where you did actually have to delete your emails instead of just letting thousands go build up unread. And so Paul Ginsberg created the central repository in 1991. It was not actually Cole's archive at the time. It didn't become uh, internet-based for a few years. So that, that happened in 1993, and it became archive in 2001. So it existed for 10 years under a different name, very much a, the same kind of way of working, though. And then the other thing that happened in the 1990s was uh, SSRN was launched, and this was largely the, the second preprint server. This launched in 1994 and is just like Archive, still running today. Uh, the difference here is Archive is still community-owned. SSRN uh, was bought by one of the big traditional publishers. That's getting ahead of myself. So it was bought by Elsevier in 2016 and continues to flourish. It's, it, since 2016, the big change with SSRN is that the uh, breadth that it covers has greatly widened. So it was very much a social sciences, humanities kind of preprint server. When Elsevier bought it, or since Elsevier bought it, it's now widened much, much beyond that. Um, and I think every year they start increasing the, the, um, the variety of preprints they accept. So SSRN now holds a lot of biology related preprints, for example. And then in 1999, we had this proposal for the creation of eBiomed. And eBiomed was modeled on archive. However, this never really took off. And it never really took off because again, a number of journals just didn't like the idea of people sharing preprints at this time. The New England Journal of Medicine ran an editorial where a few things were said. So they described this, this potential platform as a potential threat to the evaluation and orderly dissemination of new clinical studies. And it, that it would probably have disastrous effects on the paid circulation of journals. Now, you'll all notice this, this first comment is something we still hear, especially when it comes to clinical studies and clinical preprints. There is a, a big reluctance to accept preprinting in clinical spaces. And the second quote I pull out because I think it's very telling of perhaps more the real reason why journals maybe didn't like preprints, which is that it would have an effect on their paid, paid circulation. The other thing that, that really ended any chance of eBiomed taking off is that the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology threatened to lobby Congress to prevent the, the creation of eBiomed. And so this never got off the ground. It kind of quietly faded away. Between then and 2013, there were various attempts to start preprinting. Some things came up that later were sunsetted. I'm skipping over those because I think the next major advance was in 2013, where we had two things happen. One, we had the launch of PAJ preprints, and then we also had the launch of BioArchive. Now, PAJ preprints is no longer running as a preprint server. That was uh, shuttered in 2019. But BioArchive is still going very well, celebrated its 10th birthday last year, and of course has also spun out more recently into MedArchive as well. Getting ahead of myself again. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about BioArchive because there's a lot out there you can read. Um, there's also, I've put a link to a podcast here if you want to listen to John and Richard tell you all about the origins of BioArchive. I recommend listening to that because the other thing we cover there is sort of why preprinting now was suddenly accepted when even in the 1999 point, it wasn't. And sort of what, what the shifts were around leading to that, that acceptance by certainly by the publishers. BioArchive was started in 2013 out of Cold Spring Harbor. And it was started by John and Richard here. And there's a lot of really cool things happening with BioArchive right now. Uh, it's currently being spun out into its sort of own nonprofit entity. And I think there's a, a really bright future for that. And this really laid the groundwork for biology, at least, to adopt preprints 
as a, a more normal practice. And you can't talk about preprints without talking about the COVID pandemic. It's a very recent history, but I think, again, this is a pivotal point in the preprint story that we all got to live through. Isn't that nice? So when the pandemic hit, preprinting was around 2 to 3% of the biomedical literature. By the end of the pandemic, it, it's more around sort of the 10%. It's about 12% as of last year. And during the early phase of the pandemic, we actually saw, so I'm talking about up to sort of May, about 40% of all code research was first shared as a preprint. If you look at the first year, uh, a quarter of all of the COVID-related research was first shared as a preprint. And this was huge in terms of biology preprinting. We really hadn't seen anything like that. The other thing that, that happened during the pandemic was the use of preprints substantially changed. So the number of people accessing COVID-related preprints in particular was just unprecedented. And this very much led to a much broader adoption and acceptance, not only of preprints, but of thinking about scientific publishing and, and how we communicate our research to other people. And so just, just to take you back to, to this slide as I try and wrap up, relatively on time today. There's a point I want to make here. Um, and this is to also not just talk about preprints, but talk about the format of how we share scientific findings. In the 17th century, it was largely letter and essay format. Around 1880s, we adopted the IMRAD format. So this is the kind of format most of us will still use today to write up our results. So you've got your introduction, methods, results. Uh, and, and discussion. It feels kind of horse and cardy still. Um, even with preprint servers, we're still stuck in this PDF age. We're still stuck in this age of scientific findings being this very strict format. It, it's not very adaptable. It's not very interactive. And when I said I would talk about what the future might look like. And I think this is one of the things that, at least for me, excites me most about preprints is that they do allow us to play around with all of these things. With a traditional journal, no matter what you do, you are stuck with these very fixed formats. Preprint servers allow you to do a lot more and you can share your work in a lot of different ways. As an example, during the pandemic, we saw a lot of single figures or single tables coming up as papers instead of having this long, complete story. There are some people who use preprint servers to effectively update their story as they go through. So they'll, they'll post their initial findings or initial story. And then as they do lab work, they'll continue to update it, which is, it, it, it's great to see that because that's, that's how science works. But it also allows us to do really cool technological things. So there's a variety of different platforms that will overlay things on top of other things. Preprint servers are doing a really great job, I think, at the moment of adding trust indicators to a bit of work. So BioArchive is the prime example of that with their little toolbar. And I, I, I'm not going to linger on this. I just want people to think about sort of the way we share science and what that might mean moving forward, especially in a, an age where certainly at the moment everything seems to be video based. And it's an area where we as scientists haven't particularly got that involved with yet. The other thing that we're we're seeing, and I think is going to be the next sort of foundational point for preprint history, is the formal recognition of not only preprints, but preprint peer review. These are just a small number of examples here. So we've got EMBO, who accept uh, reviewed preprints for their fellowships. Plan S, who effectively said a, a peer-reviewed preprint is equivalent to a peer-reviewed publication. And then the Gates Foundation, who you will hear from a lot more in November, who from next year will have a new policy that requires all their grantees to preprint their work, and they're encouraging preprint peer review. I think this is really important language because it, it helps to separate out preprints from the peer review process. And it, it kind of suggests that, as a lot of the data does, preprints can stand on their own as perfectly valid outputs without the need for peer review. But peer review is a nice addition to that. It's a nice trust signal if it's done well. And so this is something that is really growing. I think over the, the previous few years, we start to see these things happen. The other thing, of course, is that we've seen governments and 
but the really high level kind of top down approaches to change. And this is very much dictating the future. And I want to end, I, I think I'm ending on this slide. In the past few years, we saw very closely released statements, one from the White House, which was the Nelson memo, and one from the European uh, Council. Effectively, they both kind of said the same thing, which is that all research that is publicly funded should be freely available and accessible without any embargo and totally in a non-for-profit manner, without any delay. The European Council went a little bit further than the Nelson Memo did, but they do say effectively the same thing. And one of the things that I think really fills this, this requirement is that the Publish Review Curate system, a system that is based with preprints at the very core, and then you have these other elements on top of that where you can use them if you want to, but they shouldn't be these essential parts. And so this is where I think the future is probably moving towards. It might not be PRC, it might be a different model, but I think the important part is that whatever we do in the future, it very much looks like preprints are the core to that, that, that future of sharing science. If you have any feedback for these sessions or the community calls, please do fill out the form we've got there or the one that will pop up at the end of the Zoom call. It'll take you less than five minutes. If you're not subscribed to our newsletter, you can subscribe to that. And you can also join our community if you're not already part of that. We love having you around, so please do all those things. Otherwise, if anyone has any questions, feel free to, to drop them in the chat. I'm just going to pick up on Josh's point about uh, the impact of preprints during the pandemic. So the personal opinion is that preprints were critically important for the global pandemic response. Um, they really were. So the, the, the work I showed you there was work uh, we were involved with doing. We also did some work looking at the quality of the preprints, which was really interesting stuff. I'm doing more on this. So we, you'll see more come out at some point about the pandemic and preprinting. But I think it is really important to, to, to just to highlight just how crucially important they were, because even when the journals eventually changed their policies to adapt to sharing things quicker and temporarily for free, preprints were still outpacing them in every regard. So even at the height of the pandemic, you could post a preprint to BioArchive within 48 hours. Couldn't do that to a journal unless it was one of those uh, very questionable bits of research that came up the same day in some of the journals that we saw. Uh, although a lot of that has now been discredited. The other thing we saw with preprints that we didn't see with the journals is that things were removed almost as quickly. Um, the, the really good example early on in the pandemic is there was a, a preprint linking COVID to the HIV spike protein uh, in terms of structure. That was posted on BioArchive and it was pulled within a weekend um, because of the, the problems with that, that bit of work. So it, it, was a, it really was a cultural shift and it's one that we seem to have kept with, which is quite nice. So I said by the end of it, we were sort of nine, 10 percent preprinting levels. That's continued on. We're at 12 percent as of 2023. And I think a lot of people who first used the pandemic as a way of sharing stuff as preprints have, have carried on sharing their work as preprints for the most part.